Good day. Welcome to the Great White North, where things are white and a bit cold. It was 2013 when the iconic and original DJI Phantom was released, and in the years that have passed, the technology inside these drones has advanced significantly. But the basics of capturing stunning aerial footage has remained the same. In this video, I'm going to share with you what I've learned over the past few years of flying professionally, which will hopefully help you improve your aerial footage. And full disclaimer, throughout this entire video, the word cinematic will be used only once. And that was it. The first and simplest means of improving your aerial footage is by making smooth movements. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Recklessly pushing the control sticks to their limits is going to produce harsh, jarring movements. Learning to have a delicate touch is not overly difficult and just requires a bit of practice. Start by making smooth, simple, and small movements. Challenge yourself to move the aircraft forward in a straight line as slowly as possible. Remember not to take your thumbs off abruptly. You need to return the control sticks to the center position just as smoothly as you move them away. Once you've mastered those small and simple movements, try adding in movement from a second axis. In addition to aircraft movement, making smooth gimbal movements is just as important. Unfortunately, unless you're using either generation of Inspire, the rest of the DJI drone lineup relies on a very awkward dial for tilting the gimbal. Again, practice will help, especially considering how finicky the dial really is, but equally important are the advanced gimbal settings. Take a minute to locate any gimbal settings in your aircraft's companion software. With this Mavic 2 Pro, I am able to adjust gimbal pitch speed and gimbal pitch smoothness. Speed is the maximum speed the gimbal is able to move, and smoothness is how quickly the gimbal starts and stops moving. Adjusting the maximum gimbal pitch speed and gimbal pitch smoothness to your liking will help massively in creating very smooth gimbal movement. The final piece of the smooth movement puzzle is your aircraft's flight mode. DJI drones typically have three modes, which are tripod, sport, and positioning. Of those three modes, tripod offers the smoothest aircraft movements. Personally, I use positioning, and I take things even further by adjusting a few advanced settings. Expo, or exponential curves, determines how inputs to stick controls are translated to aircraft movement, particularly in the stick range around neutral. Think of these curves as a ratio of stick movement to aircraft movement. An S-curve, a high number value, gives the control sticks more sensitivity. Small control input creates large aircraft output. A flat curve, a low number value, allows the control sticks to be less sensitive at center, meaning relatively large control inputs produce small aircraft movement. Diving into sensitivity, attitude is how quickly the aircraft responds to control input. Braking determines the time slash distance needed for the aircraft to stop after stick input stops. And yaw is the maximum speed the aircraft can rotate. Gain relates to the aircraft's automatic responsiveness to environmental inputs, primarily wind. These default settings usually do quite well and don't need any further adjusting. Where possible, try composing shots with a significant distance between foreground and background elements. With this separation, any aircraft movement will produce a noticeable parallax effect. And that aircraft movement doesn't need to be overly complex either. Simply flying parallel to your subject will produce the parallax effect that you're after. To take things a step further, try orbiting your subject with distinct foreground and background elements. And for those of you using an Inspire who want to take this parallax, as far as possible, try using a longer focal length.
What constitutes foreground and background elements is relative. You might have two mountain ranges separated by a valley where obviously the close mountains would be the foreground and the further away mountains would be the background. Alternatively, the foreground might be a forest canopy as you track a moving vehicle against a dirt road, which is the background. Foreground elements don't necessarily demand a lot of composition space nor screen time duration either. Having those foreground elements exit or enter your frame as you move the aircraft very easily helps accentuate a feeling of depth and movement. There certainly are instances where it's not possible to have foreground elements. There are also instances where it's not necessary for the desired look of a shot. If you're trying to convey a feeling of vastness or isolation, then you're better off without any foreground elements. Despite your aircraft's ability to reach impressive altitudes, the most dynamic aerial footage is captured closer to the ground. High altitudes dampen any sense of movement, and the heightened perspective diminishes a sense of scale by removing identifiable objects. Additionally, with your aircraft at 120 meters, it becomes difficult to spot, and you likely won't be able to travel any significant horizontal distance before losing sight of the aircraft completely, which is important because in most countries, laws pertaining to drone operation require maintaining unaided sight of the aircraft at all times. Whether flying over an open field or a snow-dusted forest, keep your aircraft as close to the ground as you're comfortable flying. Having the camera as close to the ground as possible accentuates speed. This effect is made even more pronounced when flying over moving water. In this shot, the aircraft isn't moving any faster than 10 kilometers an hour, but it is moving in the opposite direction as the waters flow, which makes it a little more dramatic. One word of warning, when flying over open water, the bottom facing sensors of most drones aren't quite reliable, and I would recommend keeping a sharp eye on your aircraft, as it is possible it will gain or lose altitude unexpectedly. Unless you're capturing dramatic cloud formations or you're after a composition with horizontal symmetry, there's little need for the sky to occupy so much real estate in your frame. Objects on the ground certainly look different from an elevated perspective, but clouds still look like clouds from 120 meters. Even if you're taking off from a higher elevation and there happen to be clouds below you, there's little need for an empty sky to be the upper half of your frame. Consider the rule of thirds. Divide your composition into three equal horizontal slices. Keep the horizon at that upper or above that upper third division mark. This is important to remember when creating a reveal shot, when your aircraft is moving forwards or backwards and your gimbal is tilting from a downwards to an upwards position, make sure that it ends that movement so that the horizon is at that upper third division mark. Don't forget about audio. Admittedly, you wouldn't likely be able to hear crunching snowshoes with such fidelity at a high elevation, but it does quickly increase the perceived production value of your footage. And it makes it more engaging than aerial footage without natural audio. Be sure that when you're adding audio that it matches what the audience is watching, that it is synchronized with any environmental movement. If you're watching a wave crash, you should hear it crash at the exact same moment.
Current battery technology allows the average drone to remain airborne for at most 30 minutes. Each and every minute your aircraft is in the air is valuable time. You don't want to be unnecessarily troubleshooting image settings or trying to locate a specific preference in the menu. Ensure that you are familiar with the companion software that comes with your aircraft. Ultimately, your ability to capture dynamic aerial footage is limited to your ability to maximize your flight time. Yes, your flight time is valuable, but that doesn't mean you should be panicked and flying frantically, not taking the appropriate time to compose your shots. Fly with a purpose, whether that purpose is to become better acquainted with the flight controls or to capture specific imagery. Approach every flight with a set goal and a plan to help you achieve that goal. Creating a flight plan can save you a great deal of time and trouble once your aircraft is airborne. I use Google Earth to determine where the best opportunities are for a specific shot, and I use Photo Ephemeris to determine when and where the best lighting conditions will be. And be prepared to scrap your entire flight plan if the weather doesn't cooperate. Most importantly, determine what the airspace classification is where you plan to fly, and adhere to the regulations pertaining to your aircraft. Obviously, the simplest means of giving yourself additional flight time is by investing in an extra battery, or two or three. With more batteries at your disposal, you have more opportunity to capture that perfect shot, or more practice time to master your aircraft's flight controls. Having an extra battery on hand is only useful if it is completely charged. Making sure that every one of your batteries is fully charged should be part of your flight plan. So too should be checking that every piece of your gear is exactly where it should be, as there's nothing more frustrating than making it to the top of a cold windy mountain only to discover that you've forgotten your ND filters, or you have three of one prop type and only one of another. With a large percentage of your attention focused on flying as well as any other potential distractions, it's quite easy to forget about the basics of capturing video. As such, it's important to ensure that your aircraft's camera is set up to capture the best video quality possible before even leaving the ground. For starters, ensure that your shutter speed adheres to the 180 degree shutter rule. That is, your shutter speed needs to be twice that of the frame rate which you're capturing video. So if I'm capturing video at 30 frames per second, my shutter speed needs to be 1 60th of a second. If I'm capturing video at 24 frames per second, my shutter speed needs to be 1 48th of a second, which isn't quite possible on most drones, so we round up a bit to 1 50th. Most drones with a fixed lens see considerable diffraction-related image softness when using smaller apertures. Subsequently, for the sharpest image possible, you should rely on ND filters as your primary means of exposure control and keep the aperture value as small as possible. Additionally, these small camera sensors found on most drones perform very poorly in low light conditions and produce visible digital noise at high ISO values. Every effort should be made to use the lowest ISO possible. Lastly, don't forget about white balance. Using a considerably wide focal length and making dramatic camera movements means you may encounter various lighting conditions and multiple color temperatures in a single clip. You'll see in this shot how auto white balance may be convenient, but it can cause trouble. Shot at magic hour, the trees begin that proper warm orange hue, but gradually they become cold and blue. It is important to manually set your white balance at the beginning of every shot. This is time consuming, but it will produce a better product in the end.
Individually, the topics discussed throughout this video do have potential to create compelling aerial footage. However, the most engaging and eye-catching shots are the product of multiple elements combined. Flying low without giving the sky too much real estate. Making smooth movements while incorporating dynamic foreground elements. Being efficient with your time without neglecting the basics of video capture. Ultimately, there is no one recipe to create a dynamic aerial shot, and it's up to you to be creative. That's about all I have for improving your drone or aerial cinematography. On behalf of Cousteau and myself, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, if you've learned something, click like. If you have a question or a comment, put it down below. Thanks again, and I will see you next time. Good dog.